Hey Roses, welcome back to my channel. I'm Avarice Rose, and this is the fourth time that I have attempted to film this video. <laughs> we have had construction guys in, we have had construction of our fireplace being put back in that they took out a week ago. We've had them putting the fireplaces all around different apartments, and we had our friends moving up above us in the apartment that, that literally is above us. So I tried in vain to record this earlier. So now that it is late afternoon, I am hoping that I can get through this. So if you are new, welcome. Please hit that subscribe button and like this video if you like this kind of historical spooky content. And if you've been here for a while, thank you so much for coming back. I hope that your quarantine is going as good as it can be. And if you are still in quarantine until the 15th or the 18th of May, Join me every Friday for these spooky videos that I will be putting up for you. I think I live in Texas, so I think our order is lifting on the 1st, so Friday. And, but yet we still have kind of sort of an order to stay at home until the 15th. So I don't know which is which. Um, we'll just see how it goes. Without further ado, grab a snack, a hot beverage of your choice, or a cold because it is starting to warm up, and let's jump into this episode of Haunted Castles of England, Onwet Castle, and Hampton Court Palace. initially doing research for this video, I always pronounced Onnit Castle as Alnwick Castle because it's spelled A-L-N-W-I-C-K. But apparently the L and the N are silent and it is pronounced much as like panic, so Onnit. Um, Onnit or Anik, not really quite sure. Anik Castle is in the English country of Northumberland, so in the very north of England, and it is the seat of the 12th Duke of Northumberland. It was built right after the Norman Conquest in 1096 by a baron and has been renovated and remodeled a lot over the last centuries. It's a grade one listed building, so it is protected, and before any renovations or remodeling can be done on it, an inspector has to come and make sure that everything is up to the code of the time to keep the authenticity of the building and to keep the listing of the building. So graded listing, graded listed buildings in the UK, England, that sort of thing, um, they're very protected and they have to have certain codes of their own to be abided by. That's my cat screaming. Anak Castle boasts 800,000 plus visitors a year when you take into consideration the visitors who visit because of their castle, as well as the Anak Gardens that are attached to the castle estate. So as I said, in 1096, the first bits of this castle were built by a baron. So it was a baron holding first and then worked its way up to a dukedom. Because of the close proximity to Scotland's border, this castle became kind of a contested area of who owns it, English or Scottish, and which king would, you know, kind of play, play chess with it. So the castle was actually first mentioned in 1136 when it was captured by the Scottish king David I and was held by him. At this point, it was considered very strong, so it must have been a well-fortified castle in order for it to be considered a strong siege point. It was actually the site of a plot to overthrow King John in 1212, and when King John heard of this and the plot was foiled, he ordered that Onnit Castle and also Baynard Castle were to be destroyed because this man, Robert Fitzwater, um, held Baynard's castle um, King John was like, just tear them down. This is their punishment, tear their, tear their castles down. Um, the instructions, however, were not carried out at Anak Castle, so the castle remained intact. The castle originally came into the hands of a man by the name of Ivo de Vesey, and he was a Norman nobleman from Vasi Calvados in Normandy. So, <laughs> that's a 
it's a mouthful. Some of the titles that were included with this piece of property were definitely the Barony of Anwick and a large property in Northumberland and considerable estates in Yorkshire, including Malton. Since the son who was to inherit John de VC was succeeded, succeeded to his father's title and everything that he was owned was under age at the time, King Henry III actually conferred the wardship of the estate to a foreign kinsman, which caused the de VC family to be very upset. The family's property and estates were put to the guardianship of Anthony Beck, who sold them to the Percys. So from this time, the fortunes of the Percys, though they still held their Yorkshire lands and titles, um, they were earls and later became Dukes of Northumberland. So Onnit Castle has been in the Percy family for a very long time. The Percy family were very powerful noblemen in England and very powerful lords and had army to back them. Um, Henry Percy was the first Earl of Northumberland, rebelled against King Richard II and helped dethrone him. The Earl and his son Harry Hotspur later rebelled against King Henry IV, and after defeating Hotspur in the Battle of Shrewsbury, the King pursued the Earl, and the castle was surrendered under a threat of bombardment in 1403. So it has seen lots of war, including the War of the Roses. Castles during the War of the Roses were frequently attacked, and it was just one of those things where a lot of castles were besieged and either left to ruin or rebuilt. Anwick was one of three castles held by Lancastrian forces in 1461 and 1462. It was there that the only practical defense of a private castle was made, according to the military historian DJ Cathcart King. It was held against Edward IV until its surrender in mid-September 1461 after the Battle of Towton, and that is when the War of the Roses kind of took another turn. There is a lot of history of the War of the Roses that I'm not going to go into that actually occur that occurred at Onnit Ca Onwick Castle and um, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of plans made there. So if it's something you definitely want to look up for yourself, please feel free. It was a very important in the War of the Roses um, plot, so to speak. So after the execution of Thomas Percy, the 7th Earl of Northumberland in 1572, Onwick Castle was increasingly uninhabited. The ninth Earl of Northumberland placed his distant cousin, another Thomas, in charge as constable in 1594, but over a decade later, he was killed fleeing the gunpowder plot, and the Earl was imprisoned at the Tower of London. So this castle was also tied to the Guy Fawkes gunpowder plot. In 1650, Oliver Cromwell would use the castle to house prisoners following the Battle of Dunbar. So when the Charles, King Charles I was beheaded and um, the Republic took over uh, and there was a period of time where there was no King or Queen of England, Oliver Cromwell kind of took the reins but very quickly became much of a dictator slash king in his own right. A lot of alterations to the castle happened in the late 18th century, and Elizabeth Seymour and Hugh Smithson were elevated to the first Duke and Duchess of Northumberland in 1766 by King George III, whose restorations at Windsor Castle were partially inspired by the couple's work at Onwick. So <clears throat> much of the interiors at Onwick Castle were very, a reminiscent of Windsor, however, Onwick actually had the renovations done prior to Windsor. A lot of the castle interior was redone um, in an opulent Italiante style in the Victorian era by Luigi Cania. So a lot of the mid-century, the 18th century uh, design Gothic style was um, virtually erased from the castle. Another fun fact of Onwick Castle is that um, it's been featured in several movies such as Harry Potter. What are some of the ghosts that reside at Onwick Castle? So the Grey Lady of Onwick Castle, and this is uh, a story of how she is seen to the people who see her, how she appears to the people who see her. On frequent occasions, many people have spotted the ghost of the Grey Lady when walking in tunnels deep below the castle. She is presumed to be the ghost of a young teenaged girl from Victorian times who worked as a maid at the castle. According to legend, she accidentally fell down a chute to the tunnels below one day while working in one of the kitchens. Purportedly, the dumb waiter for raising and lowering food between levels also broke and fell on top of her, crushing the young girl to death. 
To this day, her spirit roams the dark corridors and passages hidden below the castle. So if you go into the dark, into the tunnels of the castle, you might find a girl. Something really interesting about Alnwick Castle is that it's not <clears throat> so haunted. However, it does boast a very strange legend, which is the Anwick Vampire. Legend has it that a man who served the Lord of Anwick Castle suspected his wife was having an affair on him. Aiming to catch her in the act, he climbed onto the roof of their dwelling and fell to his death after breaking his neck. Despite being buried, the man was spotted around town. When illness spread and livestock began dying, the locals naturally suspected him. They dug up his corpse to find it engorged with blood. Once the body was disposed of, the appearances and illnesses mysteriously stopped. To this day, the man is known as the Onwick Vampire, the name derived from medieval chronicler William of Newborough, who used the term bloodsucker to describe the man in his account of the tale, the first recorded use of the word in England. Something to look at here. I might do a completely separate video on uh, the legends of the vampire or the vampire from Romania, um, all over the world type of a deal. A lot of people associated illness, plague, uncovering bodies that seem to grow nails or grow teeth or to grow hair um, and to be well preserved until oxygenation happened or also to be bloated, kind of like full of blood. Um, there are a lot of different reasons for that. And while it's fun to think that it could be a vampire, more than likely it's just nature taking its course and the person is just naturally decaying. The skin is pulling away from the hands to show more nails. The lips are receding, so they're showing more teeth. The gums are receding. The body might bloat. A lot of the times bodies bloat after death, especially since they didn't have the embalming that we do today. And, you know, just a bunch of anatomical things could be happening. Uh, so fun to think about, fun legend, fun lore, but most likely not a true vampire in Onwick Castle. One special thing that Onwick Castle does boast, they're not afraid to share their few ghosts that they have as well as the legend of the Onwick vampire. So they have what's called Castle After Dark Below the Stairs and it runs through October and it's a great warm up for Halloween and they take you through the walls of Onwick Castle to discover secrets of this medieval castle. Um, tickets apparently are 15 pounds per person and are available to buy from the 27th of September as of last year. However, for this year, don't really know how much ghosty tours are gonna be happening. A lot of these castles, actually guys, that I have been talking about are closed for the foreseeable future. So for much, in, a lot of them that I've seen are closed until July or August. And tourist season in the UK for a lot of these places is between like May and, and like August. So they're really losing out on a lot of money, a lot of revenue that isn't just used to pay their staff who love these historical buildings, who love telling you the stories when you go and visit, but also the upkeep of, upkeep of the grounds of the actual structure itself. So if you do feel so inclined on any of the castles that I have spoken of and you want to make a donation because you know you're not going to be able to go or you just want to help historical places, please feel free to do so. And that includes places here in the US that might be historical and need um, some donations to keep up the upkeep for, because history is important and we, we don't wanna lose it. We've had it for so long, especially these castles who've been around for centuries. It'd be horrible to see all of the hard work to keep them in good use and not disrepair fall by the wayside. Not sponsored at all, I'm just saying. If I seem extremely giddy about talking about this next castle, it's because I am. Quite frankly, Hampton Court Palace for me is like amazing. There's so much history. My favorite era happened, revolved around this place. 
and that is the Tudor era, the Elizabethan era. I love Hampton Court Palace. And when this crap is all over, you bet your bottoms, I am gonna go and I am gonna enjoy every second of it. And I'm gonna cry in every video that I take when I go there. But on a more serious note, the original Tudor Hampton Court Palace was built by Cardinal Wolsey in the early 16th century, but it soon attracted the attention of Henry VIII, who brought all his six wives here. Hmm. Surrounded by gorgeous gardens and famous features such as the maze and the grapevine, the palace has been the setting for many nationally important events. So Cardinal Wolsey is said, alleged, to have given gifted his amazing palace at Hampton Court to Henry VIII in order to stay on his good side. So Cardinal Wolsey, for a little bit of background, it was a cardinal um, to England. He was one of the highest people that Henry VIII listened to in, his, to, in the more infant younger parts of his reign. He had lots of money. He was using a lot of his parish's money. Um, a lot of the, this is right in the height of the Catholic Church. This is before Henry wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon, before he even met Anne Boleyn, supposedly. And right around the time of Henry being like, I love your castle, your palace. Might I stop and use it? And the Cardinal wanted to, wanting to stay in the King's good graces said, it is yours. Um, and for a very flippant king who could off your head like that, you know, play your hand slow, Wolsey, because mm, the end for Wolsey didn't end so well. He died, not a friend to the king, and of illness. He very, very barely missed the scaffold. By the 1530s, Hampton Court was a palace, a hotel, a theater, and a vast leisure complex. The King Henry VIII would use it to display everything that he had, magnificence and power every way possible, through banquets and extravagant court life and art, and if you wanted a room at the palace as Duke and Duchesses or Earls and, you know, um, Earls and ladies, <laughs> countesses, sorry, um, you could for a price. Diplomats would also find themselves lodged at Hampton Court Palace, so it was kind of an all-in-one inclusive place. So Henry had his own private apartments where he slept, ate, did his business. The Queen also had private apartments, and for the courtiers that would accompany both of them. A lot of happy memories happened at the palace, and a lot of unhappy memories <laughs> happened at this palace, um, especially for Henry. This castle is a set piece in Tudor history, in Elizabethan history, um, for many reasons. His third queen, Jane Seymour, died giving birth to his long-awaited son, who would later become King Edward VI, the boy king, for a very short period of time before he died of either um, a type of a plague or tuberculosis is what they believe to be the cause of his death, but it was really sad. I think he was 15, 14 or 15 when he passed away. Also, this is the place where the king's fourth, fifth wife, Catherine Howard, um, was held against her will when the king was investigating her uh, infidelity and supposedly ran down a corridor, escaped through guards, and was able to run down a corridor, screaming after him, begging him um, for forgiveness. And also where Catherine of Aragon was given the news that Henry did not want to be king, be want her to be queen any longer, and also possibly where Anne had many of her miscarriages and also was told, hey, you're done. So the 17th century saw many events happen at the palace, taking place in Hampton Court's Great Hall. In 1603, William Shakespeare's King's Men first performed Hamlet and Macbeth for the new Stuart King James I, Mary, Queen of Scots' son, Elizabeth I's heir. And James was responsible for organizing the 1604 Hampton Court Conference that resulted in the publication of the King James Bible in 1611, 
the authorized version of the Bible in English. James's son, Charles I, who was infamously beheaded, um, used the palace to keep a lot of his art collection. He had a huge art collection. It became his prison. In 1647, he found himself under house arrest when he was defeated in the Civil War. And he attempted to flee Oliver Crom Cromwell's parliamentarians. Um, he escaped through the Privy Gardens. Um, he was later unfortunately recaptured and executed in 1649. During the Commonwealth era from 1649 to 1660, Cromwell saved the palace from destruction by making it his home. Hmm. Despite his Puritan ideals, he appreciated fine art, particularly the tapestries, because there was a place called the Tapestry Room that was and still is incredible in Hampton Court Palace and enjoyed living like a king there which is ironic. William III and Mary II took the throne in 1689. <clears throat> this is William and Mary of Orange. They asked Christopher Wren to design a new Baroque palace for them. So Wren scrapped his original plan to demolish the whole palace and instead created the spectacular fountain court leaving much of the Tudor palace intact. So when you look at Hampton Court, it is actually two palaces, two time periods melding together. You have the Tudor side and then you have the um, 17th century, more Baroque style side, which is amazing. And we can be so thankful for that because doing that, they preserved a lot of the history of Hampton Court Palace, because if it had been demolished, oh my goodness, so many stories would have just disappeared to the wreckage of time. The ghosts would be like, where are we going to go now? And of course we wouldn't have the amazing palace the original palace where we can actually walk where Henry VIII and his wives, all of his wives walked. So George I um, built an impressive suite for his son, the George II, Prince of Wales, and his wife, Princess Caroline. He also commissioned a new kitchen known as the Gregorian House. And he, being George II, unfortunately no longer wanted to use Hampton Court as a royal palace. And it was quickly filled with grace and favor residents so people who he liked. The various apartments, though not always the grandest, were and not always the most comfortable to live. Residents regularly complained that the palace was perishingly cold and damp and some had no access to hot water. The apartments continued to be granted as late as the 1960s, and although the practice has now ceased, there are still a couple of elderly residents living in Hampton Court today, which is pretty cool. Say you live in a palace. In 1838, Queen Victoria ordered the gates of Hampton Court Palace to be thrown open to all her subjects as an early act of generosity. So this allowed visitors to finally flock to enjoy the stunning palace architecture, get lost in the maze, and relax in the beautiful gardens. The building for the palace started in 1515. The palace went on to become one of Henry's two most favored residences, the other being St. James's Palace, um, it is one of the only two surviving palaces out of the many that the king owned. Though Henry VIII owned a lot of palaces, had a lot of palaces built, but only two remain, St. James Palace and Hampton Court Palace, um, which is really sad. Also, when Queen Anne was allowed to uh, redo one of the great halls. There's a room where, hen where H's and A's were kind of entwined in this new uh, monogram signature for the king and queen. And when Anne was beheaded, uh, Henry had them very quickly covered up. However, one survived, probably in the rush job. So there is one H and A um, little symbol in in that area and kind of like Anne smiling like she still got her way. Hampton Court was a place of drama, spectacle, and heartbreak. So of course there's going to be ghosts up the wazoo here, right? Right. Let's get into it. The Spectre of Silver Stick Stairs. A sad white wraith carrying a light lighted taper is said to be Henry VIII's third wife, Jane Seymour who died post-birth to complications at Hampton Court, only a few days after delivering Henry VIII's long-awaited son, the future King Edward VI. 
While delighted with his male heir, the king was devastated with the sudden loss of his perfect queen. A pale figure is reported to appear on the silver stick stairs, which once led up to a room in which Jane gave birth and died on the anniversary of Edward's birth in October 1537. The Screaming Queen. Henry VIII's fifth wife, Catherine Howard, was as wild as Jane Seymour was mild. Catherine's ghost is far more vocal and the sightings more regularly reported. She also happened to be a cousin of Anne Boleyn. Catherine was beheaded at the Tower of London in 1542, aged 19 for adultery and treason, two of which she actually committed. Adultery for sure, treason, eh, is it really treason when your husband's already cheating on you? Eh. When it's a king, yeah. It's claimed that after she was arrested in Hampton Court, the terrified teenager broke free of her guards and she ran along what is now called the Haunted Gallery, screaming out to the king for mercy. She never reached Henry, who was in prayer at the chapel. Guards dragged her away and she never saw Henry again. It is said that her anguished ghost now repeats its heartbreaking journey, screaming through the entirety of the gallery. The Grey Lady. There have been numerous sightings of the Grey Lady, AKA Sybil Penn at the palace. Sybil was servant to four Tudor monarchs and wet nurse to Edward VI. She nursed Elizabeth I, devotedly through smallpox in 1562, the queen recovered, but poor Sybil caught the pox and died soon afterwards. Sybil's tomb was disturbed when the church was renovated in 1829, and shortly after this, stories began to spread of a gray lady seen to walk the corridors of the state apartments and clock court at the palace. Sybil has also linked the mysterious spinning wheel noises that were said to come from behind a wall in the Grace and Favor apartment. Legend has it that when the wall was removed, an old, much used spinning wheel was discovered. Strange sensations. In May 2000, the noted psychologist Richard Wiseman conducted an experiment at Hampton Court to investigate whether ghosts were really all in the mind. He asked volunteers to describe themselves as believers or non-believers in the paranormal and asked people in both groups to record any unusual experiences as they wandered around. As you might expect, Believers reported spooky sensations overall, but interestingly, many participants recorded more unusual incidents in the same places, the haunted gallery and the Georgian rooms. Whether or not they knew about the legends, this suggests something's happening, but what it exactly is isn't really clear. Knock, knock, who's there? In 1871, two male skeletons in shallow graves were unearthed under a cloister in the fountain court during a routine excavation. Their discovery brought huge relief to one palace resident, an elderly woman living in a nearby Grace and Favor apartment. She had complained of constant banging and knocking on her walls, but no one believed her. All disturbances ceased when the remains were properly interred. It has been suggested that the anonymous men were victims of roundhead villainy during the Civil Wars. They may have been hastily buried in unmarked graves, which were concealed during the Wren's building of the Baroque Palace in 1689. In October 2003, the palace CCTV camera captured the image of a ghostly figure apparently flinging a fire door open. Had this been the age of social media, the image would have certainly gone viral. Back in the day, it attracted international media attention. No living soul has ever come forward to admit that this was their prank, and security staff have remained baffled. And if you would like to go see this video clip, just type in Hampton Court Ghost, Hampton Court Palace Spectre, Hampton Court Ghost Opens Door, and you will find it. It exists. That's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed learning about Onwick Castle and Hampton Court Palace. Hampton Court being one of my personal favorites that I could just talk to for hours just about the history and the goings on and the drama that happened there. It's like the original Downton Abbey, but with blood, a lot more blood. So thank you for watching. Give this video a like if you like this kind of content. Subscribe. I post videos every Friday in my Haunted Castle series. I probably only have about three more episodes of Haunted England left to go. If not two, the next few are going to include some abbeys, some graveyards, or some other sites like Stonehenge or um, the Ram House Inn. So they're not necessarily gonna be castles, but they are in England, so they will be under this tag. 
Thank you so much for watching guys. For those of you who have commented below on how much you enjoy these videos, I appreciate it. So stay inside, stay safe, stay sane. One love you guys.